So, um, yeah, good, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to spend the next half an hour uh, talking about the future a little bit, doing what analysts like doing, uh, looking at what's going to happen, uh, not actually over the next two to three years, but maybe the next five, 10, 15, 20. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, change and disruption, and in particular, uh, what my team does at 451. Uh, we look at technology, and we're really interested in how technology is going to change things, or may change things. Maybe it won't change that much. I um, want to begin with a, a kind of story, um, an example from uh, the, the IT industry uh, that, that I certainly followed very closely in, earlier in my career. Um, way back in the late 1990s and uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, IBM was the king of networking. I don't know how many of you remember SNA, Systems Network Architecture. Uh, they were to networking what Microsoft was or is to desktop operating systems or what Google is to search. They were, they were totally dominant. They, were, uh, uh, they had a multi-billion dollar uh, unit of IBM, very profitable. Uh, they were not only dominant, but they had built an architecture to maintain that dominance for the next generation, uh, which was a fact that had not escaped um, the governments of both the US and the EU. Uh, so they were uh, a very, very successful organization, and they saw no change coming. And then along came this device. And this was developed by some engineers at Stanford University uh, mucking around with Unix systems and, and uh, seeing what they could do with routing tables. And they licensed their technology to a tiny little startup called Cisco Systems. And within 10 years, IBM's networking business had been brought to its knees. Um, at the end of the 1990s, IBM put up the white flag and they signed up as a Cisco partner and reseller. Um, a decade later, Cisco began to face the same antitrust questions that IBM had faced 20 years before for market dominance. The whole world moved to flatter, cheaper, more open, flexible networks. So it had been a fairly dramatic change in 20 years. So this is just one example among many of how a technology can disrupt an entire industry, industry it sweeps all others aside. And in the process, it transfers financial value from one supplier or group of suppliers to another, and it obsoletes the existing technology. So this, this example fascinates me, and there are, there are many others. And it gets me wondering, every time I walk around a data center, you know, I see the gen sets and the UPSs and the, chill, and the chillers and you know, all, all of the copper wiring and, and the aisles and aisles and, and the vast amounts of money that's been invested. And, and I'm always wondering, is there anything that's going to seriously disrupt this? So um, it's not just us, I think, as analysts that have to do some forecasting on this. If you look at, a way, at the way that data centers are paid for, especially, I, I think, in the commercial sector, this is important. Uh, this is an example of a three megawatt data center build. It's interesting looking at Matt's earlier figures that our, our model here has uh, about 15 million a megawatt uh, for a mission critical data center, but the numbers aren't important. The, the point is that 45 million of a uh, total cost of ownership of 90 is committed up front. So um, if something comes along in those later years that is going to completely change the economics of the business, then you know, that is going to be um, a serious liability because these costs are spread out, obviously, over a sustained period. And it's interesting when I've seen um, spreadsheets uh, looking at the planning new data centers. You know, there's a lot of calculations for the internal rate of return and the cost of capital. There's normally something about energy prices, but it's, it's quite often uh, you know, not, not a very good model. And there's almost nothing about the technology and how it might change things. So anything that happens in the technology, probably going to be a bit of a surprise. So 
What we did in my team is we said, well, okay, let's look at all the technologies that we're aware of, and we built a list of about 30 or 40, um, and said, you know, which ones could be disrupted? But of course, then we realized we needed some kind of methodology to compare them. So we looked at it like this. If I said, if someone said to you, there's going to be an earthquake, the first thing you'd say is, you know, are you sure? How likely is it to happen? So that was one of our factors. And then, you, then you'd say, when? Uh, and uh, you know, so that, that is, how fast will it happen? And then how big an earthquake will it be? Um, so how big is the impact? Um, I appreciate you can't normally forecast earthquakes, but you bear with me. So, um, so, we, so we develop these uh, three metrics, and then we build a mean, and uh, they come up with a disruptive rating. And uh, so we listed these technologies. We're only going to look at, at 10 today. Um, and uh, then we put it out to the most senior group uh, within the 451 group, an uptime, and we got them all to rank them. Um, I don't want to get too hung up on the ranking, but it's just an interesting way of, of looking at them. So what the ratings mean is that uh, if, if the figure is below three, it probably means don't worry too much about that technology for now. If it's above three, I'd say you want to be watching it fairly closely. And if it's getting to four, just a little below four or above four, uh, there is going to be some disruptive impact. And you really ought to be paying very close attention. And you need to be perhaps entering you know, some kind of planning phase as to how you might accommodate it. We, we didn't look at every technology um, in the end. Uh, there are number that we're going to look at later. But um, we wanted to focus on those that have basically very low adoption today or no adoption at all, um, that could enjoy very high adoption if, if the wind blows in the right direction, um, and that have the capability of disrupting the uh, economics uh, of the industry, the technical design of data centers, and, and the roadmaps and plans of the suppliers. So uh, these are some of the technologies that did not fulfill those criteria. Uh, I don't know if you can all read those, but um, basically we, 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 um, we ruled out an, a number because they were just too far out, like, say, quantum computing. Um, we ruled out some because even if they were adopted, they wouldn't be that disruptive. Um, maybe you might argue direct current power might be that. Um, and critically, we didn't really cover some that are um, enjoying a reasonable level of adoption already. And this is really important because um, that means we did not include virtualization. We didn't look at multi-core processes and uh, you know, some, of the, some of the newer servers that are out there. Um, and we didn't look at cloud computing. So it is the opinion, I think, of pretty well every uh, analyst in the 451 group that the cloud computing and, and everything that's associated with it is enormously disruptive. And I don't think anybody's um, arguing with that. That's um, certainly, in the, I think, changed not only the technology of IT and the, and the industry, but um, is changing the way we look at the pricing and the economics and accountability. Um, Talking to my colleagues in uh, 451 Advisory Services, um, and in particular the work of Steve Carter, uh, he, he believes that um, the combination of multi-core processes uh, and virtualization uh, has really dramatically improved the uh, processing capability of uh, IT, and that most people have not fully utilized that, or indeed scarcely utilized that. And when they do, uh, you will start to get fairly dramatic improvements in, uh, in, in IT capabilities, and it will effectively release data center capacity. So I encourage you to see uh, Steve's session later in the week. He gave an excellent workshop yesterday, um, so, so watch for that. So let's look at those that we did consider. So I'm going to run through a list of 10. Um, and they're not in any particular order. And obviously, we're going to have to do this pretty quickly. Um, so uh, if you look at the rankings, um, we'll be able to get an idea of which are going to be uh, most interesting to watch. So number one is um, low power servers. So these are the servers that are based on mobile phone type chips from, for example, ARM or the Intel Atom. I'm sure there's going to be new processors coming soon. Um, 
And really you can get um, tens or hundreds, and I think eventually you'll get thousands of these uh, microservers within a single chassis. Um, so you're gonna start to get very high th processing throughput um, for effectively 10% of the power and 10% of the space, or at least this is what um, the, the manufacturers are advocating. This is a key technology in HP's Moonshot uh, project. Um, there are manufacturers out there like C-Micro, um, Calzeda, and, and others. Um, the likelihood is that it's, it'll often act as a, a kind of hardware uh, proxy for virtualization with each individual server um, having just single uh, VMs or applications. So um, the view was 3.53, uh, the rating. So what that means is uh, watch very closely, probably don't need to move to planning phase necessarily, but could be disruptive. Um, but actually, this was one of the lower ones. So um, interesting, but, but not dramatic. On-site clean power. So I came to this whole data center industry with, with it, particularly looking at energy and the green, green aspects. Um, so this is a, always a very talked about subject. Um, so this is solar power, wind power, uh, possibly fuel cells, building microgrids um, around that. One of the things that um, became clear to us looking at this is that um, if you wanted to generate uh, clean energy on site, you, you need to have a very good energy storage strategy uh, because of the intermittent nature of the power. Um, so that does pose problems. Um, I think the cons were quite significant. Uh, the cost was very high. Uh, the scalability issues were quite big. Um, and uh, you know, there are obviously availability issues because of the intermittency. So this came in actually as the lowest single technology in, the whole, in all of those that we looked at. So 2.62, it basically means uh, don't worry about it for now. Advanced DSIM, my, my special subject really. Um, so we're not looking here at DSIM that has 38% adoption. Um, we're looking at the next generation of DSIM where it really binds itself much more closely to uh, IT service management where the demand side of IT is um, uh, intelligently linked to the infrastructure management so that it becomes, if you like, a, a kind of uh, flight management system or an operating system for the entire data center where there's perhaps an autonomic um, control element. Um, the view is, and if you read the report, um, is that this is not just a technology in its own right, but it's an enabling technology for many of the other disruptive um, technologies. So um, at 3.72, that is one of the highest scores. Um, so I think that is something that even if uh, you're still just in the first stage of implementing simpler forms of DSIM, uh, you need to be thinking about having a, a way forward to some of the more advanced uh, types. Cloud level resiliency. So this is, um, this is quite a complex subject. Uh, this is really uh, you know, something that comes up a lot, and I know the uptime guys get this question a lot, is you know, is it gonna be possible to lighten the physical infrastructure, perhaps dial down on some of the redundancy at the physical level and have more at the cloud and the software and the network level. It's a pretty complex subject because it's so driven by business requirements and it's so driven by the network capacity. It's driven by factors like the speed of light and latency and all kinds of things. And there's a lot of complex IT. Um, nevertheless, you know, we spoke to quite a few people about this and you know, th there is definitely a considerable level of interest. So while I think that this is um, uh, definitely a complex long-term project, I, th I think it's definitely something that's taken pretty seriously. And uh, my colleagues agree because that, that was given a pretty high rating. Silicon photonics. So if any of you have looked at the open compute um, initiative by Facebook, silicon photonics is, is right at the heart of that. Um, but there's initiatives also at HP, uh, IBM's doing work, uh, various others. And gradually learning to bring optical um, interconnects into the actual motherboard so that they can start to fabricate optical connections on silicon. What this means is you can start to get very high speed connections between components, between, for example, storage or networking, 
as though they were all very close together. So you can disaggregate the components of a server, scale them up, and spread them out over the data center. In a way, what it does is you can start to think of the data center as an entire single computer and design it and optimize it like that. So very promising, interesting technology. Nevertheless, uh, it didn't get the highest score. It's somewhere around the middle. And I think the reason is that it's basically still in development. Um, and also that it, I think it's going to need some new designs, um, some new standards before it's fully effective probably some standardization uh, efforts between the manufacturers, but, but a, a definitely interesting one to watch for the future. Chiller-free data centers. So, you know, we're all, I think everyone here is fully aware of, of the initiative to move towards free cooling, whether it's indirect or direct. What many fewer people are interested or prepared to risk doing is having no mechanical refrigeration at all. Uh, if you can do that, you might slash a significant slice off the CapEx costs. Um, so you know, we're certainly seeing uh, chiller-free data centers being built um, in many regions of the world, um, usually amongst certain types of organization that have lower uh, tier type requirements, business requirements. Um, but, but interesting, and it certainly enables those people who are able to take that risk um, to considerably reduce their costs. Very dependent on climate and, and on the business needs. Uh, but certainly as the server inlet temperatures come up, uh, the, the IT becomes more resilient. The opportunity to do that, the envelope, if you like, uh, widens. Um, nevertheless, um, still quite a low score. And I, I was quite interested. I was going to have a peep at whether it was uh, my uptime colleagues who had actually scored that low. Um, but but I, think, I think the issue is that uh, for, for many, it's perceived as just a little too risky right now, uh, for, certainly for many geographies. But again, definitely one to watch. Power proportional computing. So this means that uh, systems of all kinds use power in direct relationship, direct proportion to the amount of work they are doing. And if all the systems in the data centers are doing that, then effectively the entire data center is doing that. So that means that the base load in particular is starting, could, could theoretically drop to a very low level when the work is low and to a very high level um, when, the work, when the work is high. Um, it really means that that kind of automated power management using sleep states, et cetera, is, isn't really necessary. So this debate about whether you're going to um, turn the power management on your servers or on or off um, may not be necessary. Um, one of the challenges with it is that that swing in power consumption means that the difference between peak load and, and uh, low load is very wide and uh, it may require software to try and uh, deal with that, perhaps move workloads around and, and, and this, this kind of thing. Um, could also obviously then mean that when, for example, you're suddenly turning all the servers on or the, or the servers are all going up automatically, uh, cre it creates heat. So you need to be able to uh, respond to that. So, so it's an interesting one. Um, 3.4, that's one of the lower ones. I, I personally would make a case to my colleagues um, that this will probably happen anyway. This is not necessarily something people will consciously adopt. This is something that will gradually be built into the hardware. So those power swings are maybe something people need to think about happening more in future. Flash storage. So we're not talking here about the, f well, we are talking about the flash that we have in, in your smartphones, but we're talking about using it in, in a different way in the data center. So we're talking about all flash arrays uh, or um, even in for high performance type uh, situations, all flash data centers. And I certainly envisage um, small HPC type data centers going all flash at some point. So. Um, the advantage of flash is it's 10 times faster than the fastest disk, so it can bring the data in very, very fast, very good for certain types of application. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, very low on power and very low on space. We had a Guide Award winner here last year that got, um, from memory, 90% space savings and 82% power savings um, for, a, for uh, I think, a whole data hall that they had, had moved to flash. Um, so potentially uh, very significant. It's not suitable for all types of, uh, of um, applications. Uh, the problem at the moment is the price. Uh, 
we think the price is going to fall to somewhere around parity with the fastest disks in somewhere around three to five years. And when that happens, the flash will certainly get a boost. This came out top as the most disruptive technology of all of, all of them. So um, it sounds like uh, if this is right, um, you should be preparing for flash in your data centers. Prefabricated modular. So obviously I heard an interesting point in the last session. Um, and I'm pretty sure some of the suppliers here would, would have liked to have answered that question. Um, so I'm sure everyone knows how these work, but the, the data centers or the major components of them are uh, designed and fabricated off-site, whether they're uh, whole data centers or just the M&E components. Um, the proven designs are used over and over again, so standardization is key. Um, and uh, capacity, should, it should be possible to deliver capacity uh, in small um, plug-in increments. Um, in the pro, notice I have rapid deployment, um, but also said, uh, you know, inflexible for some and uh, less economic at scale. So it, it, I think the key issue here is that the use case for prefab modular uh, is a thing that, you know, we really needs to become clear over time. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, it certainly is, um, in spite of some indications that adoption is a little patchy, there's no doubt that at least some of this is, being, um, is the future, and uh, I think the figure there uh, reflects it as quite a high figure. And then the last one we put in, um, memristors, which is something some of you may not have heard of. And this is, um, you really need to understand microelectronics quite well to fully understand the implications of this. Uh, but this is a new class of semiconductor um, that really uses resistance to store data. And th the real key is that in, w when this, if this comes to life, this will far, far, far outperform any other form of memory. And it'll be non-volatile, um, very fast, very low power. And it will be possible uh, to bring some of that memory and storage actually into the motherboard, so you, you, or, or even to fabricate them alongside the processor. So you might start to see the division between processors and storage actually uh, disappear as you, as you move towards these single, very, very powerful devices. I was at HP Labs uh, last year spending some time looking at this technology, and you know, HP certainly feel that this is very revolutionary. Um, but they're not the only ones. There are other people working on it. We'll have to see that how this pans out. The score wasn't that high, and I think that is correct, because at the moment, um, the most we've seen is an IBM uh, HP executive show an early fabrication on, a, on stage. So we haven't actually seen anything working, but um, very, very interesting. So we put these uh, technologies together on our, on our uh, bubble map, and uh, basically the higher, the nearer to the top right, the more likely they are to have an impact on the data center industry. Um, so I don't know how clearly you can see that, but uh, uh, you know, Flash is, is up there in the top right. Um, and clustered in the middle, remember we eliminated a lot for, for the purposes of today that aren't so interesting. Um, clustered to follow our cloud level resiliency, uh, advanced eSIM, and prefabricated modular. And the size of the circle indicates what we think is the disruptive impact. So, you know, flash we think could be very disruptive. You'll notice that memristors is quite low in terms of how likely it will be adopted or how fast, but the actual size of the bubble is quite big if ever it does come to pass. And uh, down there in the bottom corner, uh, yeah, um, we'd all love green energy to, 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 to work, um, but right now the engineering isn't there. Um, so just to, to recap, um, the one with the biggest score is Flash, um, cloud level resiliency to follow. So what does all this mean? Um, you know, I think first of all that um, there needs to be much more focus on capacity planning of the entire digital infrastructure. I think um, to, to, in order to compete, um, particularly against the cloud providers and the fantastic economics of scale that those companies have, um, 
capacity planning is absolutely critical and you need to look at the IT side and the, and the way that the IT uh, roadmap is spanning out and you need to look at it in conjunction with the infrastructure which I think is going to see a lot more innovation than we've seen over the past um, uh, 10 years. Second point as, I, as, as I've said is I think uh, the data center is already being disrupted and just because your own data centers may not have seen much change doesn't mean to say that that um, change is, isn't coming. Um, and finally, you know, I think uh, it's easy in the data center industry to focus on the infrastructure level, but I think it's really important we, we, we as an industry start assessing all of these technologies. And my shameless advertisement is uh, we have published a 25,000 word report on all the things I've spoken about. So uh, if you're interested in getting a copy of that, see um, your local 451 or uptime representative. Um, and with that, I'm willing to take any questions. If there are any. There's one here. Uh, the mic's there first, so we'll deal with that one first. Okay. Good morning, Macleo from CERT from Brazil. Uh, I read something about the use of graphene technology in semiconductors. Uh, did you could talk something about that? Because, because I read that Samsung are developing uh, a small component that use, uh, use uh, less energy and uh, the, there is the capacity uh, is, it, it, and it is 100 more faster than the uh, uh, nowadays processors. Have you ever heard about that? And the name is Beristore of Samsung Company. It was patented last March this, this year. And IBM are develop, developing something similar with graphene technology. Have you ever heard about that? Um, it's graphene, is that right? Yes, graphene. Yeah, so I know about graphene, yeah, because uh, developed in the UK at Manchester University, which was uh, where I went. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I have heard about it. We didn't look at it. Um, I, th I think, you know, that is... That I've heard you. I'll, take, I'll put it on the list, and we'll, we'll include it in, the, in stage two of this project. Um, I mean, we do always hear about these, you know, major new breakthroughs in electronics coming through. Um, a lot of them don't actually happen, but I think the graphene-based stuff might, so... Um, let us come back to you on that one. Good question. So, Andy, uh, this is uh, Shekhar Das Gupta. Let me stand. Oh, Can you see me? Yeah. I got you right. Okay. Uh, I'm Shekhar Das Gupta. Uh, one has been hearing a lot about uh, the software-defined infrastructures or software-defined data centers. So, uh, on these disruptive technologies which you have just talked about, uh, how do they fit in into this new world which is supposed to be coming about in software defined infrastructures? Right, so, um, so the whole software defined thing, um, and by the way, my colleague Eric Hanselman is, is a huge expert on this, and if you get a chance to talk to him, he is here. Um, comes out of the networking world with software-defined networking. Um, and, you know, just for those who aren't clear, you know, the idea is that you um, simplify a lot of the, um, if you like, dematerialize a lot of the, of the work that goes down at the physical level and you bring it up to a simpler centralized or semi-centralized um, control level. Uh, and, and, you know, we're certainly seeing a little bit of that happening in storage. You could argue that it's already happened in, in servers. Its impact on data centers is, is less clear, um, but we've certainly uh, looked into whether advanced DSIM, or the kind of thing I was just talking about, we do refer to it in the report, advanced DSIM might be a crucial component to support things like the software-defined data center. Um, because you know, what you're really doing is you are bringing much more into the so centralized software control layer and bringing adv advanced management 
um, adv advanced um, control and as far as possible in, at a centralized level. Um, and DSIM is a really crucial component because that's the bit that gives you the, visibili the visibility of all the things happening down at the bottom layer. So we didn't address software-defined X or software-defined networking as part of this particular project, but I definitely think the, let me rephrase it, the software-driven data center rather than defined data center is, is in my opinion, going to be very, very key. We could talk about it some more. It gets quite technical. I'd like to have my colleague Eric sitting alongside me. Was there one more? Yeah, hi. Good morning. Um, I had a conversation with an with a enterprise end user who was talking about using flash versus spinning disk technology. And he was concerned about the reliability and the lifetime of the life cycle of flash. And over time, having that be less reliable with data loss and what have you. Have there been technology increases recently that will uh, wind up uh, the result that you had up there that says Flash is going to overtake or will su supplant spinning disk. Do you see that happening? And then there was a, you said there was, a, there was an industry, or it's not for everyone. So was there an industry you had specifically in mind when you said that? Um, well, I think, um, you know, when, when we moved from you know, every type of new memory that you bring in, people say, you know, the, the longevity of, of it isn't necessarily proven. And that's, that's definitely tr true of some of the solid state storage. Um, I think, as I, as I understand it, and we have storage experts um, plenty in our company who could address this in, in great detail, but my understanding is that, you know, we're talking about using flash, you know, if you like, in a, in a sub-second, day-to-day, hour-by-hour usage, but you would still, to keep the data over longevity and have reliability, you would still archive back to other forms. So, you know, an all, even an all-flash data center, you know, it's not like the, it would stay in flash forever. It would still be archived out. Um, so I'm not sure about whether what work's been done on, on the reliability of flash over time, but um, I don't think you would keep everything in flash for those reasons. Um, great, I think I'm more or less exactly out of time. But we've lost the MC. Ah, in the wings. Thank you, Andy. Great, thanks.